It was a stormy and rainy day on May 30, 1889 in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Johnstown lies about 70 miles east of Pittsburgh. Throughout the 1800s, iron, coal, and steel quickly became central to the town of Johnstown. By 1860, the Cambria Iron Works of Johnstown was the leading steel producer in the United States. About 14 miles upstream from Johnstown sat the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, a private rural getaway for the Pittsburgh wealthy. The members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club were an elite group of powerful men who owned Pittsburgh's steel companies, ran its railways, and controlled other large industries. The most powerful among these men were steel tycoon Henry Clay Frick, industrialist and entrepreneur Andrew Carnegie, banker Andrew Mellon, and many others. The centerpiece of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was Lake Conemaw, a man-made reservoir holding 20 million tons of water. Fed by the Little Conemaw River and other small creeks in the area, Lake Conemaw spanned about 400 acres and was held back by the South Fork Dam. The dam was constructed out of earth, rocks, and clay and measured 931 feet long and 72 feet high. At its base, the dam was 270 feet wide but was only 10 feet wide at the top. Between 1881 when the club was opened and 1889, the dam frequently needed repairs. The leaks in the dam were patched with mud and straw. A previous owner had removed three iron discharge pipes that allowed a controlled release of water. There had been a speculation and concern about the strength of the dam that were raised by the head of the Cambria Iron Works downstream in Johnstown. Due to the heavy rains on May 30th, Lake Conemaw was rising at an astonishing pace. About 10 inches of rain had fallen in a 24-hour period. The water was almost at the breast of the South Fork Dam that held back the lake from the valley below. The storm had come from the east and was recorded to be the worst storm to have ever hit the region. The rivers and streams were filling at such a pace that the banks could not hold all of it in and they began to overflow. By the morning of May 31st, Johnstown already has water in the streets. Workers at Lake Conemaw desperately tried to raise the height of the South Fork Dam to prevent the water from flowing over the breast. John G. Park Jr., who was at the dam, rode on horseback to warn everybody in South Fork about the condition of the failing dam. The first of three telegraph warning messages was sent to Johnstown between 11 a.m. and noon on May 31st. It had to be carried by hand part of the way due to the broken and damaged telegraph lines from the storm. The second of the three telegraph messages was sent out a little while later based on the information of Dan Cyber, a man that was visiting the dam at the time. He warned that the water was flowing over the breast of the dam and is becoming more dangerous. This message was also had to be carried by hand part of the way. The final telegraph message was received by Johnstown at 2.44 p.m. by Agent Decker. This was the only message that made it all the way to Johnstown without having to be carried by hand. It was from the information of John Baker, who was at the dam. His message warned that part of the dam's breast had been washed away and that the dam is unstable. At 3.10 p.m. on May 31st, the South Fork Dam gave way with the force of Niagara Falls. The wall of water immediately hits the town of South Fork, where it claims its first victim. A total of four people die at South Fork. As it continued to move down the narrow valley, the wave reaches 75 feet high. The water and debris stack against an 80-foot high stone railroad viaduct where the flood is temporarily stopped. The debris begins to push against the viaduct and it eventually collapses. The water rushes toward the town of Mineral Point and washes away the entire town, taking 16 lives with it. As the flood continues down the valley, it takes trees, rail cars, barns, and houses with it. The wave and massive debris continuously roll over itself as it goes. John Hess, a railroad engineer, could hear the flood coming and sped his train backward toward East Conemaw, blowing his whistle in warning. The flood continues to gather debris and speeds towards East Conemaw, where over 50 people will die. The town of Woodville is completely wiped away, killing 314 people and 89 horses. The wave reaches Johnstown at 4.07 p.m. 
The water follows three paths through Johnstown, backwashing against the side of the mountain and destroying everything in its path. People, animals, and the mass of debris pile up against the giant stone bridge damming the flood. Johnstown becomes a lake, spanning 30 acres wide and 10 to 30 feet deep, destroying other small towns around it. At 6 p.m., the mass of debris at the stone bridge catches fire and burns for five days. The flood has destroyed Johnstown at a force similar to the Mississippi River, leaving 2,700 people homeless and 2,209 people dead. The total damage would equal up to $17 million. The magnitude of the Johnstown Flood wiped out entire generations of families and many people would leave to never return. Almost immediately, the survivors began to reconstruct the town. Clara Barton and the American Red Cross assisted in the flood relief effort, helping to care for, feed, and provide shelter for the flood survivors. According to the Johnstown Area Heritage Association, the role the Johnstown Flood played in the history of the Red Cross is another reason why the flood remains so significant in American history. Soon after the flood, an investigation was conducted into the failure of the South Fork Dam. It was determined that the original dam had been poorly constructed and that the members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club had not taken measures to properly maintain the dam. Ultimately, despite the lawsuits brought against the club and its owners, no one was ever held responsible for the dam's failure and the destruction it caused. As a result of the Johnstown disaster, liability laws were changed so that people could be held responsible for damages caused by unnatural use of land, such as the South Fork Dam. Stricter engineering practices and dam building would also be put into practice in the years following the flood. The South Fork Dam was rebuilt two more times, but both ended in failure. Today, just the remains of the north and south ends of the dam serve as part of the National Memorial to those who lost their lives in the Great Johnstown Flood.